The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and today... No, 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 that's the wrong video. Oh. We're doing something yep. different today. Never mind. Sorry for interrupting that scene. I had to because earlier today this happened. Since the last project I have developed this add-on board for the Beaglebone Black. It's a cape. I call it the stop motion cape and I want to give it its first test run. So let's plug it in. Oh, oh. Uh, whoa. Well, that didn't go as expected. The beagle bone is dead. My cape doesn't work as intended. I must have made some design error, trapped in some PCB design pitfall. <sighs> okay, Clem, it's your turn now. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and today we are talking about PCB design pitfalls to get your project professionally manufactured and not going up in flames. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Let's start with the basics. What is a PCB? Well, a PCB is the thing that all the components get mounted to in a professionally manufactured product, an electronics product in that case. But it's actually just a piece of resin plate that has copper traces etched onto it to make all the connections you need. So basically it's the same thing like when you do projects with components on perf board, proto board or strip board, but all the connections are pre-made onto the board and you only have to solder in your components. That's the way professionals do it. So if you're a maker and you're doing electronics projects, you might get away with just some protoboard and some perf board and do a one-off thing. But what if you want to do multiples of one? What if your project is really cool and you want to share it with the world? Or your project is so complicated, it would be extremely tedious to wire everything by hand and it would take an enormously long time. That's where PCBs are very handy. And those are not only for professionals, everybody can do it and I show you how and how you should not do it. To design your own custom PCB, you need software, of course. Most commonly are used Eagle, KiCad, Altium, EasyEDA and many more. Stick with whatever feels natural and easy for you to use. For this tutorial, we are going to use KiCad. Before starting a new project, regardless of which kind of software you use, always check for the latest updates and known bugs with new versions. You have to downgrade or upgrade accordingly, but always check that beforehand, because down the line you may run into some bugs. I actually ran into this trouble when I wanted to design a Raspberry Pi hat. And turned out, my version of KiCad that I had installed only had a template for the original Raspberry Pi with the 27 GPIO pins, not for the current version. So I had to find that, download it, install it, but I could have saved a lot of trouble if I just downloaded the newest version of my software. It's always a good idea to breadboard your project before soldering. Accordingly, it's also a good idea to breadboard it before drawing it up in your design software. I should have done that, because there are some quirks you would only find out if you prototype it and not in the design software. With my PCB design and probably yours too, there were some components that were not included in the standard libraries. So I had to find them online, but it turns out it wasn't the right part. It was a different size. So always make sure you really have the correct part downloaded from any CAD libraries online. And usually you have to draw a few parts yourself because you won't find them online. I did that, but there are also some pitfalls. Be aware that there may be some components that have a very similar or the same part number, but are actually different. This DB25 connector 
has the same part number than the upright one and I chose the wrong one. This may seem not a big problem when you're designing the PCB, but when you go to assemble it, you may have problems with clearance. I've used this tiny Panasonic 3V relay in a lot of projects before. It works great with the Raspberry Pi and other single board computers because you won't burn out any of the pins. You can use it to drive bigger loads and it's very reliable and cheap. But the downside is there is no schematic symbol pre-made for them. So I used a generic relay symbol in the beginning and when I tried it to associate it to my custom made footprint, according to the datasheet of the part, they won't match up because the pinout is different. So I had to redesign that and that's a pitfall you should not fall into. If the part is not listed as that specific part in your libraries, design it from scratch. The central component of this project is a TMC2130 stepper driver by Trinamic. I've used this exact model in the Macroscope project. If you have not seen that, I don't know what you're doing with your life. Watch that right after this video. When using these modules, there's a twist. You don't have any libraries for them. And if you find some, they are usually for these Polulu A9 something drivers that usually should be pinout compatible with some minor tweaks. And I thought, hey, that would be easy. Let's use the schematic symbol for this driver, hook it up the way I want to drive the TMC2130 and then do a new footprint. I should have known better. If you are using similar parts for your PCB design, you may run into trouble. Because even if they are drop-in replacements for those specific parts, they might not be fully compatible or only compatible if you do not use certain features. So if you're designing a new thing, you should always use the correct schematic symbol with the correct pinout. And sometimes the names are just different and you will mess that up afterwards when you don't remember that clock on this one is exactly reset on the other one and they should be both tied to ground, but you don't do that because on the other schematic, it shouldn't be connected to anything because those are actually UART connections and you have no plan what you're doing. The original drivers where I got the schematic symbols from are soldered in with the chip facing up and the dynamic ones are soldered in with the chip facing down. And it's very easy to flip them in your mind and turn them around and you can easily mess that up. The pinout was actually matched correctly in the schematic design, but when I transferred it over to PCB New, which is the PCB layout segment of KiCad, I associated it with another footprint I made earlier and those didn't match up. So the pins got scrambled and I wasn't aware that there are any connections altered. I routed my PCB design and when I tested it, the smoke came out. The same problems do apply if you have to solder in components dead bug style or from the other side of the PCB. Always keep that in mind, it could mess with your layout. So make it as easy as possible for you. Use one side of the PCB for components if possible and only go to the other side section wise. So if your power supply section of your design does not fit on side A, move the whole section to side B and keep everything else on the rest. That way you won't mess up your brain that much. Let's talk about power distribution. If you have to supply your project with multiple voltages, that seems like a daunting task, but you can make your life much, much easier. Just think of streets. If you only want to go slow, you can use a narrow street, a path, it doesn't matter. You will reach your goal. But if you have to go very, very fast, or a lot of cars have to go there very fast, you need to take the highway or autobahn or whatever you would like to call it, a motorway, for example. This allows you to go much, much faster and much more cars can pass through, which means more current, more voltage. Think of the lanes of the autobahn like the wires of positive and negative. So the lane in one direction is positive, the lane in the other direction is negative. And usually they are separated by a border in the middle, so they won't cross each other in case of an accident. 
And that's the same with your PCB design. Always separate ground and positive voltages from each other and also separate narrow low voltages from bigger high voltages. Start with the biggest positive voltage. In my case, this is 12 volts. I'm using a trace with calculator online to determine how broad this lane has to be to carry enough current for my project. In my case, one millimeter would be enough. I would go to two millimeters just to make sure I will never exceed the limits. So bigger autobahn for bigger currents. Now I want to do the other power bus. In my case, plus five volts. I use my track width calculator to do the exact same thing. Determine the needed track width for the current and for the voltage and route my 5 volt lane. It's time to route your board. Routing means establishing all the connections. We already did that with the power bus, but now it's time to connect all the data lanes or whatever you want to distribute signal wise. There is a thing called auto routers or auto routers, which are automatic functions that do all the connections. But keep in mind, those are not always right. I ended up with some unconnected traces or some faulty ones or very confusing ones. So I tried to route as many connections as possible by hand and use the auto router to make it finished. Always double check the connections you made or the auto router made, because sometimes all these routes, these paths are so close together that they might end up in a short circuit. So give them as much space as possible, or you can end up with a board that is not functional or could have shorts. Before you convert your design to Gerber files to send them out to the PCB manufacturer, always double check, triple check, quadruple check them. I did a double check, but I didn't check it that good because I had time constraints. So always make sure you have enough time and you leave yourself enough time. Maybe ask a friend to take a look at it or post it on the Element 14 community and ask people if they might spot any errors. It's always a good idea to finish your design, take a step back, like go to sleep, do something else, come back the other day, check it again. You may find something that you didn't find on the other day. Some things line up perfectly in theory, but do not line up at all in reality. If your project has to fit on an existing product, you should always use an official template for it. And if you can't find that online right away, ask the manufacturer. Usually they have a GitHub repository of some sort where they keep their files. In my case, this is a cape for the BeagleBone Black. So I found the BeagleBone Black template in the KiCad libraries. And if they would be not included, I could always use the GitHub of BeagleBoard.org. When you're building your project on protoboard or a strip board, you usually only solder the connections you need. So why should you do anything differently with PCBs? Well, electromagnetic interference. It's time for the flood fill, which is basically creating a ground plane on all the unused parts of your PCB to shield it from outside interference. It's always a good practice to do that if you don't do it, your project may be susceptible to radios or other uh, electromagnetic working devices. Depending on the software you are using for PCB design, you may run into trouble with flood filling. You could end up with unconnected pads or could connect some pads that should not be connected. So always double check after flood filling again. These beautiful PCBs were made by Eisler in Germany, which ended up costing me about the same that I would pay in China, but they were much faster and I think they look a bit better. So be aware that the board house will do exactly as you specified. So if you make any wrong connections in design, they can't handle that. They will do it as you send the data and you have always have to do that according to the specified settings on the manufacturer's website. So always go there before exporting the Gerber files, check for their minimum trace width, minimum drill size, and so on and so on. Set your 
settings in your design software to these settings and then export the Gerber files like they say on their web page. Usually you will find a step-by-step -step tutorial about that. A lot of PCB manufacturers have Gerber viewers on their web page. That means if you upload your Gerber files, you will see them rendered out before you. And this gives you the chance to double check if everything looks like it should. You may end up seeing, oh, here's some soda mask on a pad that should be exposed or hey, that writing is backwards. That gives you a hint that your Gerber export settings are not correct. When you have finished uploading your project, you have a lot of options to choose from. You can get different colors, thicknesses, additional features, but it's usually best practice to stick with everything standard. This ensures that you get your PCBs as fast as possible and stick with the lowest quantity because the least projects end up with a perfect first version. Usually you order a draft and if that works like you intended, you then order the real quantity you need in your specified color with all the features and bells and whistles you want. You may have encountered a lot of writing on these PCBs and geometric shapes, but did you know that you can also draw on them and use bitmap graphics? I would highly recommend you check out Dave Darko on the Element 14 community. He does great PCB badges with sloth designs and Knight Rider and what else? So he uses these PCBs really creatively in custom shapes and with custom graphics on them and that's really cool. You should try that. And if you have bigger projects with a lot of knobs and switches, you can actually make face plates with the same technique. Just use the graphical elements in your PCB design and get rid of all the electric components and you can just order a face plate from any manufacturer as you would do with a PCB. So you can get the PCB stuff your components onto that and use additional PCBs as the enclosure for your project. Like with the most projects in the world, my first draft didn't end up perfectly. But I have learned a lot from that process and I will do a second version and you will see the outcome in another Element 14 Presents video. Do you have any creative ideas what we could do with circuit boards? Could we use them as something different as circuit boards, like enclosures or something that you just invented, let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash suggestion box. This is where your feedback counts. You can also post there your idea for future builds that we may take on the show and you have the chance to win that particular build. Also make sure you leave your comments on element14.com to get featured on our community feedback segment. I gotta go. I have to redesign my circuit board and then when I finish that, another project is waiting for me. <laughs>